Wait. I don't know. Yeah, I'm on now. All right. Good morning. After a quick fix. Um, Say welcome, and we're glad to be together today um, to worship. Just a few reminders, um, and that is uh, for Operation Christmas Child, July is next week, and so we will be switching from the um, colored pencils to combs, and we'll be doing combs. Remember, we're collecting these for boys ages 10 to 14, um, and the basket will be back there in the corner, um, just like it is now when we collect the combs. Also, Chrome and Coffee, um, there is going to be a sign-up sheet going around right now. I think Denny has it prepared. If you'd like to help with the next Chrome and Coffee, it is on July 8th, the Saturday after the 4th. So it is really in two weeks. Um, and he's looking, they're looking for partners to help uh, put that on. If you've never helped before, it is a great opportunity to come and fellowship. If you've helped before and you want to do that again, it would be great and awesome as well. Um, it is a great time. If you want to come, there's a DJ. Uh, we got to see Darlene even danced uh, last week, last time for us. Um, <laughs> Did he? Well, it was a glory sighting last week in the picture. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, it's a great time. It really is. I think last month we had over 30 cars there, even a semi from the 1970s. And so come and be a part of that. It's a way of engaging. Uh, Denny has written some great devotionals to go with that as well. Also, next Sunday is Bible Buddies Breakfast. It is the first Sunday of the month. And so for the kids, it is a time to meet Chris. And she has prepared breakfast for them and also um, helping them memorize scripture. VBS, um, the Community Vacation Bible School, will be August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. That is a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It is a two-day vacation Bible school. Group makes a weekend vacation Bible school where there's just two nights. It is what we felt that we could handle right now and put together. And so it is a, a community team. that. So there is a meeting on Tuesday night here at 6.30. All the churches have been invited to come to be a part of that. The theme is Pets Unleashed. And so you'll be hearing more and more about that as opportunities come for decorating and these teams start to form as well. And also volunteers up to be able to walk with kids from station to station. The um, VBS this year will be um, at the community center on that Wednesday, Thursday, and on Friday evening, we will have a closing program and um, supper there as well. So this Tuesday is the team meeting here. And so if you know anybody that's interested, please come. Um, Sandra is coming home, an opportunity for um, us to be and partner with her in her coming home. Um, in this fall, she will be going to Michigan for a, kind of a debriefing of going to three week program to help her assimilate back into the culture of the United States. And so we want to walk alongside, we want to help sponsor her in that, in her next steps in ministry. And that's what the colored envelopes on your table are for. If you'd like to partner with her in that, um, the cost of the program is around $5,500. Um, she is paying part of that, but we're just walking alongside her um, in that in support of her as she comes back to the United States. And then we say welcome to Tina Barlaghi, who is going to be our new preschool director for Sunbeams. And so she has started this past week. And so we have informed the teachers and um, that she is starting to meet with the teachers. She is going to be with us um, in a couple of weeks on the 16th as we worship. And she's going to come to greet you and um, to introduce herself to you. And so she'll be here July 16th with us. And we say welcome and we welcome her her aboard um, for that. And she is um, excited to be here, excited to connect the preschool um, with the church and um, put our next steps forth.
And so we continue our sermon series, A Summer at the Movies, and um, today we're going to take a look at the Dr. Doolittle movie called Doolittle um, that was created in just 2020, but based on a, um, a classic book. And so may we prepare our hearts and our minds as we um, prepare to worship in the presence of the living Christ. Thank you, Sharon. Will you stand with me for the call to worship? Come and hear all who fear God, and we will tell what God has done for us. God has given to all mortals life and breath and every blessing. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to you. You are the source of creation. You are the maker of the, war, of the world and maker of everything in it. You are never far from any one of us. We come into your house this day, worshiping you, seeking you. You are the giver of life and our every breath. Reveal yourself to us, dwell among us, and abide in us. We live because of you. Our hope is in you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom we live and we breathe and we have our being, for you are the spirit of truth who abides in us. In Christ's holy name, amen. May we raise our voices and sing together. I 
the children to come um, for a special message. Well, good morning. How are you? Good? Well, I brought a picture of a what? A boat. And the boat has a name. Do you know what the name is? Can you read that? The, the boat's name is worship. Do you know that all boats have names? They do. Their, I know you're wearing your pretty socks, aren't you? <laughs> all boats have names. They're all named something. And this boat is named worship. Do you see the word ship in worship? Do you? Well, that's because when we come to worship, we offer our ships. Hmm, that's pretty strange, isn't it? We offer our ships. We offer our ships. Our ships are ourselves. We offer ourselves as we come to worship. Do you know there's a, a, a scripture that says we offer ourselves as living and holy sacrifices? Well, that's what worship is about. We come and we offer ourselves for worship. We offer our ships. We're the ship, right? Well, when we grow up, we can be all different kinds of ships, can't we? Are there different kinds of ships? There's cruise ships, right? There's like freight ships that carry um, goods around the world, right? There's big yachts, aren't there? There are all different kinds of ships. There's even like little motor boats, right? Uh, canoes, all different kinds of boats. And so we're all different kinds of boats. You'll grow up to be all different kinds of boats. All these people out here are all different kinds of ships. I know you're wearing a dark purple bow and I love it. <laughs> we're all ships, aren't we? We're all different kinds of ships, aren't we? But you know what? How does a ship go? How, what makes it go? A motor, doesn't it? And we have to have a motor to make our ship go, don't we? And what makes the motor go in a ship? What makes a car go? 
You have to stop and go to the what? The steering wheel makes it go, but there's something else you have to put in the car to make it go. Gas. You have to put gas in. You have to put fuel in. Just like, just like ships, you have to put fuel in your ship to make it go. Well, we need fuel to make our ships go. We need fuel to make ourselves go in the world, don't we, and to serve Jesus. We have to have fuel. If we don't have fuel, the, if you don't have fuel in your car, it just what? Stops, doesn't it? It doesn't go anymore. And if you have you don't have fuel in your boat or your ship, it just slits out there and floats and drifts around. And so the fuel that we give it is the fuel of Jesus. They do. They can go beep, beep, can't they? And we have to have, we have to, <laughs> your facial expression, Kennedy. <laughs> you, we have to have fuel to make ourselves go, don't we? So let's make sure that we fuel ourselves with Jesus, right? So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for being our fuel so that our ship will have direction. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may go to kids' worship. I'm going to invite um, Nancy to come. Um, we One of our things of next steps is always to um, be able to come and say, what, uh, what, uh, what have we done with SLI? And what are our next steps and some things that we've been doing? And so invite Nancy to come and you need to stand. Good morning. For the past 18 months, one day a month for approximately eight hours, the Next Step team has been meeting. We have been learning how to love and lead by becoming spiritual leaders. This process is to help us join Jesus in his revolution to transform leaders, communities, and the world to become passionate disciples sharing the love of Jesus Christ. As the next step team, we want to engage and connect others by equipping our congregation to serve together. We want to keep you informed of what this team has been doing. During this time, we have had different assignments. Some of you have already had the opportunity to serve on the different teams, such as the Engage Ministry and the Connect Ministry. We have also had assignments of reading books, the first book we read was called The Anatomy of Peace, Resolving the Heart's Conflict, which we had a lunch and learn on, plus soul keeping. Another one was Necessary Endings, and another one was Canoeing the Mountains, Strengthening the Soul. The one we are reading right now is Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. And we have been passing around a clipboard with the book on it, uh, and if you'd like one of these books, we're more than willing to get it for you. When the soul of our leadership, but most of all the souls, oh, let me start over. This book is about the soul, your soul, my soul, the soul of our leadership, but most of all, the soul of the church. When a church loses its soul, it begins to slip into mediocrity and unable to give life. When we recognize it, it's costly and almost too late. For an example, we have a credit card. Losing our soul is like losing our credit card. You think you have your wallet or purse. You don't give it much thought until we don't know where that credit card is. Until one day we reach for it and we can't find it. Have you ever done that? You start scrambling to find it. Questions come to mind. When did I use it last? Did I give did I give it to my spouse? Did I leave it at Walmart? You stop doing everything to look for it because otherwise ma major damage could be done. Do you feel that same urgency when you become aware that we have lost our soul or the soul of the church? This past week, the Next Step team met. We looked at chapter five and six in the book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership. The slide you have been looking at, I hope, <laughs> is a part of our study. 
We have been following Moses and his leadership as the Israelites pass through on their physical journey, which corresponds to passages in the scriptural journey. The slide represents markers of the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. What stage most resonates with where you experience your, your life right now in your spiritual journey in the church? Are you, is it prepared awareness, the time we are not aware that we are in bondage or that we need God to lead us into something more, or the awareness stage where we realize that our heart is longing for something more, calls us to take responsibility for responding to what we are seeing, being able to see possibilities of living in new ways, often takes a visionary leader or someone who is a little bit further down the road to help us see what we have not yet been able to see. Or are you at the turning point? A person becomes aware of how the pain of their past has twisted their relationship or, and, and challenging times for a leader because he or she realizes that things are not going to be quite as easy as we had hoped. Or the roundabout, God in his kindness leads us in such a way that this stage we don't face challenges that are more than what we can handle. God is not in any particular hurry to get us to the promised land. God is concerned about transforming work he is doing in us to prepare us for greater responsibilities of freedom living. Or are we at the time of tests? God is not in any particular hurry again to get us to the promised land, but God is concerned about the transforming work he is in doing to prepare us for greater responsibilities and freedom living. Mixed feelings about the rigor of a spiritual journey is a predictable part of any true journey and helpful for us as leaders to know this so that we don't take it too personally. A wise leader can help people understand their mixed feelings as very normal response to the challenges of the journey rather than an excuse to run back to run back what feels where it feels more secure. We're in that journey. We're in that journey together right now. Each and every one of you need to take a step into that journey with us. And in the last year and a half, new ways of conducting meetings have popped up. Glory sightings have become a part of our everyday worship. We have challenged you to step out of your comfort zone and become a part of one of the teams and to share the values of Jesus Christ-inspired leadership through radical hospitality, being Christ-centered, becoming Bible-based, becoming united in mission, and authentic relationships through agape love. In the next few days, take time to look back on the seven areas. Where do you resonate? What can you do? How can you be spiritually fed and help feed spiritually. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I I will say I can't say enough about this book. I've read this book three or four times myself. Um, this book is powerful as it goes and travels the life of Moses and the, the life of um, the crucible of ministry and in leadership. Again, um, SLI is not just for, um, ju it's just not for a certain group of people. It is open to anyone. Um, anyone is, um, if you feel you are being called to be on one of these teams, even if you would like to be a part of the Next Steps team, um, please come see us. It is a commitment. Um, it is a, these these group of eight or nine people have committed once a month uh, to, to eight hours. They commit to reading, operate under a covenant, um, all of those things. But it has been a life-giving um, thing and about the soul of leadership. There are stages of our awareness that we go through all the time of the cyclical nature of our spiritual life where we're unaware of, that's the pre-awareness stage where we are totally unaware of any need to change. And then we become aware 
of what happens within us or some discrepancy between our life and what we say, a discrepancy in our values where we become aware. And then there becomes the turning point. Once we become aware, what are we going to do about it? Are we willing to, to turn? Are we willing to take the times of testing and go the roundabout um, of, of testing and trying and experimenting um, to where God is trying to lead us? And what do we learn in that time? Um, I go back to Moses again. He wandered in the desert uh, for 40 years as they, the Israelites wandered. But during that time, it wasn't a wasted time. It was preparing them um, for the promised land. And so this book is a, a very powerful book. Um, if you are willing to read it, we're willing to put it into your hands. Um, it has just been powerful in the way that it speaks um, to us. And so I um, encourage you to read that. It's, it's a life changing, not only in uh, the life of leadership in the church, but in your own personal life as well. And so we come to the moment where we share our glory sightings and, and we share with each other where um, God has been at work. Um, Nancy mentioned that we've kind of made this part of our DNA and part of our culture for the last 18 months because God does amazing things every day of our lives. Are we aware of them and do we turn our attention to those things. And so um, when we concentrate on those things, we start to see God in all his glory um, and what he reveals to us. Um, it is an, it's an attitude of our hearts, what we choose to concentrate on. Do we choose to concentrate on his glory or do we always want to complain about what's going wrong? Because God reveals himself over and over again. And so it becomes a habit. So I'm going to ask you um, if there are glory sightings uh, that you want to share. Have you, where have you seen God at work this week? Go ahead, Fred. Yay. Congratulations. In England. And Carolyn is there, right? There you go. All right. Congratulations. And what God's glory, a newborn. Um, anybody else? Go ahead, Paulette. Wow. If you couldn't hear Paulette, she said when she serves uh, the lunch at uh, the community dinner, and she's even she's seen students um, be able to bow their head and pray um, before the meal. That is a glory to see that in this world. Anybody else? I thought I saw a hand. Nancy? And it is it was wonderful to be able to share life with our grandchildren and uh, to be able to be a part of their life as well. Um, anybody else? All right. So we, um, uh, uh, and we will do this one next week because I did leave that one on my desk, but we did receive a letter from Helen, our compassion a child. And so we will share that next week. Um, Patty had written to her and so she has written back um, to us. And so we sing together. And together we sing. And I did forget to announce if you are interested in helping with community dinner, um, I think our church is responsible this time. And so see Donna um, if you want to help prepare and um, serve and clean up.
for that. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. You have your prayer requests uh, that are before you. These are people that can use encouragement from hands and feet of Christ. I wanted to add one, um, and that is Pete Lundberg, which is Bill and Donna Zeisloff's um, brother-in-law. Um, who has who has cancer and so it is in her hospice and so want to keep him in prayer and add that to our list as well. So let's pray. Oh God, we come to you for you are our creator. You are the maker and you are the giver of all. We come and we know that. Um, Our being is in you. But forgive us when we become too preoccupied to even notice your presence in our lives. Forgive us when we walk through this world and we fail to see the wonder of you upholding our lives and all of creation. We walk through our lives and we fail to see that you are abiding with us and within us and around us. Forgive us when we walk through holy moments and we fail to savor your presence. And instead, we feel abandoned. And the vast sweep of life as each day rushes on with all its demands. Forgive us. Open our eyes to your presence, O God. For you are a God of love. Remind us that we may lean on you. For you uphold all of creation and the tenderness of your hand. We come sharing joys of seeing the thin places where heaven meets earth. Being reminded that you are still active in the world today. Help us to concentrate on those moments Instead of getting bogged down in the nitty gritty of life. But we also come sharing our burdens, our heartaches, our sorrow, our hurt, our pain, our sickness. And we lay it at the foot of the cross. being reminded of the hope that we have in you and you alone. Thank you for the gift of salvation, for offering us life in the midst of death and even our sin. Give us discernment and wisdom in the days ahead. And help us to be passionate disciples who follow you and share the love of Jesus with those that are around us. So that we may know what it means to be Jesus filled. Continue to mold us and make us into who you want us to be even when it hurts. We pray for transformation and for the Spirit to dwell within us. And we pray all of this as you've taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand together as we continue to sing and to allow God to breathe on us the breath of life. Let us stand together. You may be seated. We continue um, with the summer at the movies, and um, this week we take a look at the relationship that God wants to have with each one of us, that he calls us into that relationship that is his greatest desire, that we will love him as he loves us. Well, the movie Doolittle um, came out in 2020, and even though it's recently a, a newer movie, almost everyone has heard something about Dr. Doolittle. Even if it's just remembering the famous song that came from Dr. Doolittle that says, if I could talk to the animals, um, and Sharon's going to play that, right? <laughs> Well, Doolittle was based on the book, the original book, The Voyages of Dr. Doolittle. And this film uh, tells the story. It's just a remake of the book. And it tells the story of a doctor who has this ability to speak to the animals. Not only does he speak to the animals, but the animals speak back to him. Even though he is a human being and the animals, well, they're animals. Dr. Doolittle has this unique ability to communicate with them and he cares for them immensely. So I want us to just say, here's a trailer from that movie that was created for us to get an idea of what the movie is about. Trees of green. Red roses too.
Well, in this movie, Dr. Doolittle, Dr. Doolittle and the animals go on an, event, an adventure. And this adventure where he guides them and he encourages them. But they often get distracted on this adventure and he has to keep turning their eyes back to focus on their mission. If we admit it, it's kind of just like us. We get easily distracted from our mission, from our relationship with Jesus Christ, and we turn our eyes to other things. But God desires to have this relationship with us. He's always calling us back towards him. We hear this word, these words from the book of Acts this morning, where Paul is talking to the people of his day in Athens. Um, Acts 17, um, verses 16 through 28. At, uh, Paul is on his journey. We talked about Saul last week. Well, Saul is now Paul. His name is changed. If we know anything about name changing in the Bible, it's because usually when there's this transformation, God changes their name. If you back, remember clear back to Abram, Abram became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah. Saul becomes Paul. This new name that is given to Saul, he's had this transformation, and now he's out spreading the news of Jesus Christ and how God wants to have a relationship with people through Jesus Christ. You know, Christianity is the only religion that calls for a relationship. All other religions of the world are all based on rules and regulations, but Christianity calls us into a relationship. And this relationship with Jesus, God desires us to be in relationship. And so I want us to hear these words as Paul is looking around Athens, looking around at the world and the condition it's in, um, hear these words. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas into our, to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. <clears throat> Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. The word of God for the people of God, and we all say, thanks be to God. 
Here we find Paul in Athens waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas to catch up with him. They keep sending him on to other places because after he preaches, um, he preaches salvation is found in Jesus. They send him on his way because they're really afraid he's going to be arrested because he's preaching this good news because he is agitating the the people in these towns. He's agitating um, not only um, people that are worshiping other gods, but he's agitating the Pharisees as well. The Pharisees, he's agitating because their idols have become about rules and regulations. And so Paul waits here in, in Athens. And as he's waiting, he starts to look around him and he starts to observe the culture and what is going on. He becomes aware. This is going back to what Nancy was talking about. As he's looking around, he becomes aware of this situation. He becomes aware of all of these idols that people are worshiping. Paul is greatly disturbed, it says. Because all of these idols that these people, even God-fearing people, were worshiping. They were worshiping these things instead of the one true God who desires to be in relationship with us. Folks, idols are very real in our lives even today. I hope we read that scripture from Acts and we also see really the world that is around us. An idol doesn't have to be some head that is carved out of stone that sits on the top of an altar. Anything that isn't God can become an idol for us. Anything that isn't God can distract us from our vision, our mission and can distract us from our worship. Idols can really be good things in life that we turn into things that distract us. Idols can be money. Idols can be food. Idols can be even our family and our friends. It can be sports. It can be our free time. Idols aren't things that we consider bad. But an idol is anything that keeps our primary focus away from God. And whatever it is, whatever object it is, it can become an idol for us. It can distract us from our mission of being passionate disciples who share the love of Jesus with other people. It can be very simple things. In order for us to be passionate disciples, our souls have to be in the right place. We have to be in a right relationship ourselves with our creator. God has created us to reach out to him in love. God loves us no matter what. His greatest desire is for us to return that love to him. And that love is the foundation of our lives. It is who we have been created to be. We have been created to live and have our being rooted in Jesus Christ. You know, Dr. Doolittle in this movie finds meaning and finds purpose in saving the animals. He has this compassion to be in relationship with them. At the very beginning of the movie, there is this young boy named Stubbins who is out with his father hunting. His father's um, encouraging him to be a hunter. He, he sees a squirrel and his father encourages him to shoot the squirrel. And he does. 
but he has such compassion that right after he does it, he goes and he scoops up the squirrel and he goes and he runs in and he finds Dr. Doolittle in order to breathe life back into that animal so that that squirrel may live. Now, I would say, if we want to go back to what Nancy had to say, that there's a pre-awareness there. They don't even know that anything is happening there. And then there's this awareness that Stubbins has. Not only awareness, but there's a turning point that he says, i got to do something about this. And each one of these animals that Dr. Doolittle encounters has been rescued by the doctor. They've had their life restored. And out of the gratefulness in these animals' hearts, they follow Dr. Doolittle on whatever adventure he takes them on, trusting him totally with their lives. They don't let any distractions um, get in their way of their mission to rescue the lost. It's a response of their heart. They want to be in relationship, and the doctor wants to be in relationship with them. It's a very fitting illustration. God has created us. God has rescued us from our sin. And he begs us to be in relationship with him. But he wants and he desires it to be true. In order for it to be a true response from our heart, he knows that he has to give us a choice. God never mandates a relationship. Even though he loves us, he never mandates that relationship from us. He never demands our love. He gives us the freedom and he gives us the free will to choose our response to him because he wants our worship and he our relationship with him to be one of gratefulness, one of, of truth, one of honesty, one of authenticity. I think back I, when I was raising my children, they'd get into a fight and I'd say, now you tell your brother that you're sorry. You tell him that you love him. Now, do I think when I look on that and go, uh, did they really mean they were sorry? Or did they really mean that they loved each other? Not in that moment. I mean, you know, it was just me making them say that. But worship, and that's why God gives us a choice. He doesn't want us to just say he loves him. Worship is our response to our relationship with God. Worship is the activity of the soul. And it's what we place our emphasis on. We say that we worship through our words. We worship through our thoughts and our actions. And when our words don't meet our actions, then there is a discrepancy. I can say that I worship Jesus. But if my words and my thoughts and my actions and the way I speak and the way I interact with other people don't match up to the ways of Jesus, then there's a discrepancy. Worship is not about coming to church on Sunday morning and doing your thing and checking it off a list. True worship is whatever you determine is of the greatest importance to you and then giving yourself to that. When something has great value in our lives, we say it not just with our words, but we say it with our lives for all to hear. I worship that. That's what I value. I don't even have to say it. Our lives should tell it. Our worship is revealed in what we value the most. And that's what Paul is pointing out here in Athens. He's pointing out to them what they value the most. And for the people of Athens, it wasn't God. But God desires for us to put him at the top of that list. You see, worship is not about us. It's not about our preferences. 
It has nothing to do with what we like or what music we sing or what room we sit in or who we're even sitting next to. It has nothing to do with what someone else should be giving you or could give you. You see, worship has everything to do with the condition of our own hearts and our response of gratitude towards our creator. The creator who desires to have a relationship with us. You see, the Greeks knew how to worship. They were educated. They were culturally immersed people. They had a lot of money. But as Paul looked around, their emptiness came from the worship of idols instead of worshiping the one true living God. You see, we were created for the purpose of worshiping God and God alone. All the animals in Doolittle had a relationship that was steeped in their gratitude towards the one who was always looking out for them, for their best interest, the one that breathed life into them. God wired us with a hunger. God wired us with this desire to connect with him. And there is an imprint of the creator on each one of us, on our souls, that only God can exactly match. In our worldliness, we go out and we try to search to feel, to fill that emptiness. And we search and we search and we search trying to find the perfect match and the recipient of our worship. And only God will fill that space. And we find that in the practice of solitude. It's in solitude where we wrestle with God and we, where we find the freedom to be what he's created us to be. It's in the practice of solitude that we talk to God and God talks to us and that we hear. Just as Dr. Doolittle talked to the animals, God speaks to us. Dr. Doolittle loved the animals and cared for them and God loves us and cares for us. And God has provided salvation for us through Jesus Christ. I ask you today, how's your relationship with God? Have you practiced solitude? Have you heard the voice of the Spirit speak to you, guiding you and loving you? My friends, it is not anything that someone can give you. Transformation of the heart does not happen because someone gives us the things that we desire. Transformation only happens when we let go of our desires. And we let go of our wants. And we let go of our idols. And we allow God to take that space. And it's in that place and only in that place that we will find freedom to be who God created us to be and to live and move and have our being in him. Will you stand with me? Let's pray. Oh God, thank you for creating us. Thank you for loving us for rescuing us, providing salvation for us. May we breathe in your spirit. May we fill our soul with you and you alone. May our eyes be opened and our ears be opened to hear and to be able to see you at work in our lives leading us and guiding us in this journey. Even though it's not easy, 
knowing that you have our best interest at heart into molding us and shaping us because you are interested in our transformation, not in our comfort, but in the transformation of our hearts. May this day our eyes be turned to you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Let's sing. And we go from this place knowing that his blessings are upon us. And we go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.